Thanks so much for joining us for today's message. We're always encouraged to know that God is using this ministry to touch lives all across the world through what he is doing right here in Murfreesboro, Illinois. So if you have a story to share, please send us an email at info at cccmurphy.com. We trust that you will be blessed by this message. Do you know that I think it's something like uh, 50% of accidents, and I'll have to verify this next week, <laughs> but a lot of accidents, just look at your neighbor and say a lot. A lot of accidents happen in your own home. And you say, but I'm trying to be safe. And so it's not safe for you to stay at home. <laughs> That's why it's important that you're at the house of God. Do you know that there are less accidents that happen in the house of God than happen at your house? Amen. Less accidents happen here than happen on your job? If I were you, I'd just camp out here. Matter of fact, I live here part of the time, folks. I'm just... <laughs> Everybody say it's a safe place to be. And we hope you feel welcome today. We certainly are thankful for your being here and Look forward to sharing the Word of God with you. We're going to be going to uh, John, the 20th chapter, and reading from verses 1 through 8. We'll be in the King James Version today simply because the language here helps uh, better to relate to the message that we'll be preaching. John 20 and verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and came to the sepulcher, so they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher and he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying. Everybody say linen clothes. Lying yet went he not in. Then come a Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher and he saw and believed. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word because it's life. We just ask, Lord, that you would have your way in this building today and we'll give you thanks for it. Let me decrease so you can increase. Amen. Before I get started, I need to do a little commercial break here and uh, let you know that next week, everybody say next week, we will have calculated who, my wife is trying to tell me that my mic is out. What is it, baby? Need to be closer. I look like I'm from outer space right now. Okay, is it good? Thank you. I don't know what I'd do without her. She keeps me dressed and, give, you know, I'd have come out here in blue jeans or something, folks, I, <laughs> which is okay. Okay. Uh, but anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate this week those that brought people with them. So you want to make sure that the cards got turned in at the end of the service because everything is based on the cards. So if cards didn't get turned in, you're not going to have an accurate count of who came with you. Make sure you get the ter cards turned in. And then next Sunday, we're going to announce who brought the most people with them, and they're going to win a $100 gift card. So let's give them a hand for that. <laughs> and we added something else. What we're going to do is next week, we're also going to take all the cards that the guests turned in that came today, and we're going to draw four names. Those four names will each receive a $25 gift card to Chili's. Here's the catch. You have to be present to win. So if we draw your name next week and you're not here, you're not getting the gift card. 
So we're going to reach in and draw out another name until we come up with the name. So listen to me. You don't want to miss because some of these folks may not come back. So you make sure you're here and you may end up winning all four $25 gift cards. <laughs> all, right. all right. I want you to say this with me. The napkin is folded. Let me talk to you about what I just read. What had happened, I, I, I think it's unique that that passage starts out and it said that Mary came the first day of the week while it was yet dark. But it had been dark for Mary ever since Friday. The events that took place on that Friday broke her heart and caused a shadow to hover over her. When she saw the one that she loved put to death in such a horrific manner, she was shattered. But in spite of what she had seen, she does not let the darkness that she's experiencing keep her from his side. So the Bible said that while it was still dark, everybody say while it was still dark, she went and she went to the sepulcher where Jesus was. She doesn't let that darkness keep her from a graveside. She doesn't let it keep her from his side because she loved him so much. I thought about the scripture that talked about he that loveth much or he that is forgiven much, the same loveth much. And she had experienced forgiveness unlike any other. You know, think about it this way. The forgiveness that you experienced from God is so real to you that no matter what anybody else said, you would never let go of that. You know it's real to you and it changed your life. And when she went running to the sepulcher that day and then she came upon it and she saw a stone rolled away, she looked inside and it's empty. Watch her response. She didn't go there that day expecting a miracle. She went to put warm oil on a cold body. She went to put sweet smelling incense on a decaying corpse. She did not go expecting a miracle. And when you don't expect one, you're not ready for one. <laughs> and so instead of recognizing what's happened, she takes off running back to the disciples. She goes to Peter and John and she doesn't come with the news. He's resurrected. What he told us has come to pass. Instead, she runs and she allows the circumstance she had experienced to, to dictate to what she's now thinking. And she looked at them and she said they, she didn't come to report the resurrection. She kept, came to tell about a crime. They've stolen his body. They've taken him away and I don't know where they've taken him. And she's devastated. The two that she comes to are an unlikely pair to be together at that moment. It's the disciple that Jesus loved along with the disciple that denied knowing him. Think about it. Peter never had an opportunity to say, I'm sorry. He watched from a distance as Christ is crucified. The Bible said from far off. He doesn't run up and say, forgive me. So he's living with that. Have you ever had regrets in your life? You ever wished you'd have said something to somebody while you still had the chance? Don't let fear rob you. So Peter desperate and despondent. He, if I can't be with him, I'm going to go be with the one that he loved. And he went to John's side. And John, to his credit, did not send Peter away. Oh, it would have been easy for John to say, get away from me. I can't believe you. you when he needed you most, you, you not only left, you denied even knowing him. Get out of my face. But John understands something about his master. Amen. 
he knows that Jesus would forgive Peter. So if Jesus would forgive Peter, then John must forgive him as well. Oh, how well do you know the Lord you serve? How well do you know his heartbeat and his character? You see, we hold on to bitterness from the past and we won't let go of it. They did something to me once upon a time and I'm not going to release it. Jesus released it for you. So now it's time for you to release it for them. Don't carry something to your grave. That's something that he never intended for you to bear. You've got to learn how to open your heart and not be afraid. Sometimes we just shut down. We just seal up and and we don't share our feelings. If someone hurts you and you never communicate it and you're taking for granted they know, they may be oblivious to it. They may not have a clue in the world. And you're both walking around empty and hurting because you're not talking. I want you to look at the person you're standing next to and say, we need to have a talk. <laughs> Let's go ahead. I'm, I'm, not right now. Not right now. But. And so... They went, when they get the news, and I look at their response, I think about this, Peter and John find out the news, and Mary's come not to report a resurrection, but a crime, and and when they hear it, they do not call for the rest of the disciples to have a meeting. They They don't call everybody in so they can share their options and their opinions. That's the unique thing about opinions, everybody's got one. But when it comes to him, other people's opinions shouldn't matter to you. When it comes to your life and your response to Christ, you shouldn't be waiting to find out what everybody else thinks. And neither did they. They ran. They ran to the tomb. The Bible said that John outran Peter. The love that he had for Christ pushed him forward. And though he arrived there first, he paused at the entrance. He looked in, but it would break his heart to step in. For he remembered the scene he'd seen Friday. But Peter's mind is thinking differently. Peter bursts in. I wonder if he's not thinking, I failed him in life. I will not fail him in death. And so he runs in to the tomb and looking around almost as if he's saying, where's he that took away the Lord's body? Come and face me now if you dare. When he runs in, this is what he sees. The Bible's specific and very detailed about this information, which always caused me to wonder about it. It says that when he went in, he saw the linen clothes. The linen clothes that Jesus was wrapped in, he sees them laying out. Not crumpled up in a corner, but laying out. And then, for some reason, it talks about the napkin. It mentions it separately. Not as part of the burial garments, but it's very detailed about this, that the linen clothes are lying and the napkin wrapped in a place by itself, if you will, folded. Everybody say the napkin's folded. No, don't do it right now. Don't do anything to your napkin right now. Just hang on to it. But here it says that the napkin was folded and it was in a place by itself. I always wondered about that. I thought, okay, look, the linen clothes, I I get that. I understand that part. The mentioning of the linen clothes, I can grab hold of. Because when Lazarus came out, he came still wrapped in his grave clothes. Why? Because he's going to need them again. 
But when Jesus came out, he's not going to need his grave clothes again uh, because death has lost its sting, man. The grave has lost its victory over him. As a matter of fact, look at what the psalmist says about Jesus and his grave clothes. He says, this is in the NLT, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your holy one to rot in the grave. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm not going back in, boys. <laughs> I didn't buy the tomb because I just needed to borrow it. <laughs> and these garments you wrap me in, I know that you may have need of them, but I don't. And so I've laid them aside for you. But this napkin business, this napkin that's wrapped in a place by itself, folded and put in a place by itself, and I, stu I, I studied, man, I, I read commentators, couldn't find an answer. I searched history and could not find an answer. Now, I'm talking about this has been years and years ago. Matter of fact, it was about 25 years ago that I got a peek into what I think may have happened. And it came when I was on a guided tour with a Jewish man that was leading, he was the guide. And on that tour, he spoke to me and he started talking about this napkin that was in the grave. And he shared with me that there was a tradition among his family about a folded napkin, not, not among his ancestors having folded napkins in tombs, but on tables. And I listened intently as he shared his family's tradition. He said that at our house, and this goes back as far as, and I'm giving you his words, as far as anybody among his family could remember, that when a guest came over and they were sitting at the table, no matter what had been served to them, if they had enjoyed their time there, if they had enjoyed the presence, their presence, they would not use the napkin to wipe their mouth or hands. They might excuse themselves and go to the washroom and wash their hands and face, but the napkin, they would take the napkin and they would fold it very carefully. And he said, then we would fold that napkin and we would take it and we would lay it on the table in a place by itself. And it was a message to the ones that had invited them that I've been pleased to be with you. I'm coming back. Amen. <laughs> And I, I, I can't help it, folks. Now, I just got, I don't know if that's what the deal is, but it made sense to me. Because all of a sudden I look and I kept looking at that word, those, those words and the way they put it. And it said that that napkin was folded in a place by itself. And then it says, and John saw and believed. Is it possible that when John saw that folded napkin, he understood a message that Jesus was communicating? I've been pleased to be with you. I'm back. Death could not hold me. Peter, your denial did not keep me from your side. John, your anger is a son of thunder. When you're trying to call fire down out of heaven to consume men has not stopped me from releasing the fire and the Holy Ghost to fill your heart. John, I've been pleased to be with you. I'm back. We understand today that his word to us is just, I can't help it. Just look at your neighbor and say, I'll be back. <laughs> so Jesus has given his word to us. He's already told us, I've been pleased to be here. I'm coming back. Amen. I'm coming. Not only did I come back for John and Peter, I'm coming back for you. Amen. Don't forget what that angel said. 
You men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing at this Jesus? He's going to come back in like manner as you see him go. People are always questioning our faith. You really believe that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. I really believe it. I really believe. Don't you think that's a little silly? Well, it ain't the first time I've been accused of doing something that was silly. You see, I just trust him. I just believe him enough to take him at his word. Somebody said, what proof do you have? Well, I've been in Israel six times. Well, no, I haven't. How many times have I been there? Three times. Three times. I've been to Israel. <laughs> Every time I've been there, I find the same empty tomb. <laughs> Every time I've been there, I see thousands of people going to that tomb. Isn't it good to be in company of folks that believe what you do? <laughs> Some are going there maybe saying, I don't know. But one look in the tomb will answer that question for you. And I can tell you something else. I didn't find any napkin in there anymore. Because he's already answered the question for us. He's already told us, I've been pleased to be with you. And he left his napkin folded on our table. The question now is, will you fold your napkin on his table? Amen. I've thought about the people that sat with him at a table. Matter of fact, Look at the book of Revelation in chapter 3. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open that door, I'll come in to him and I'll do what? I'll sup with him and he with me. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm just waiting to find out if you're going to let me in. I'm just waiting to see if you're going to open the door. And some of us do. Some of us open the door, but then we don't like the plate we get served. I thought about a man named Judas. He sat with him, literally sat with him at the table. He had his own ideas about what Jesus would do, about how he would, he didn't, he didn't have trouble believing that he was Messiah. What he had trouble with is the fact that he wasn't taking control. Why isn't he overthrowing the government? Why isn't he, he, he coming to power? I really believe that's what several of the disciples struggle was. It's because their perception of the Messiah coming was taking over rule here on earth. What they did not understand is he already had rule on earth. He had come to lead captivity captive and give gifts to men. He came to lay down his life so in exchange we could pick his life up. And now Paul says that I'm crucified with Christ, yet I live, not I, but Christ lives within me. But they didn't know that. They didn't get that. They didn't understand it. And Judas keeps seeing what's on his plate. Suffering? you got to be kidding. Haven't we suffered enough? Oppression? Come on, God. I want, you, you, you're the Messiah. You, you need to take control. You need to take rule. When he starts hearing teaching like, blessed are those that are merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I don't think there was one of those disciples that wanted to show anybody any mercy. Peter's hacking off ears. John's wanting to call fire down out of heaven. <laughs> They'd had it. But Judas decides he's going to force the hand of God. Before we judge Judas too harshly, 
we need to take a look at ourselves. Amen. We may not have done it the way he did it. But how many times have we found ourselves trying to force the hand of God? Amen. God, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll live for you if, <laughs> really, <laughs> you're going to barter with him? After all he's already done, folks, his, fact, his napkin's already folded. He's already paid the price. And let me remind you of this. He didn't like what was served to him either. He didn't like the plate that had been set before him. He said, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. <laughs> I don't like what I'm looking at. But he also had this understanding that that plate was just the first course. <laughs> and that wouldn't be the only plate that would come across that table. That plate would soon be taken away and another course was going to be served. But Judas couldn't get that. And so Judas, seeing everything that's going on, he finally has had enough of it. And he said, man, I just, you know what? I, I don't. <laughs> and the Bible said that he went out. You remember? That's called the last what? <laughs> the last supper. He gets up from the table. Amen. Read the book of John. He gets up from the table and he goes out into the night. Because when you walk away from the light... <laughs> You always find yourself in darkness. Amen. He goes out. He betrays him. He goes through it. And then at the end of the day, he looks at what he's done. And he said, I betrayed innocent blood. You see, when you start doing things your way instead of his way, it never comes out the way you thought it would. <laughs> So let me save you a lot of toil and trial. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Just do it his way and it'll be okay. Just do it his way and it'll work out all right. You may not understand his way. You may, you may not be able to figure out his way. But at the end of the day, you'll be saying, oh, praise God. Because he did it his way and now I know the way. I thought about some other folks that didn't like what they were served either. There was one man, his name was Job. Job, Job is chosen by God and held up to the world as a righteous man. That's pretty special, folks. When God, I mean, your mama may hold you up because mama is going to hold you up no matter what. I mean, you can be as ornery as a snake and mama's going to hold you up. Are there any mamas in the house? <laughs> mama's going to give you a pass to everybody else. She may whip your hide, but in front of everybody else, she's going to look at, oh, this is my baby. Don't you talk about my baby. But for God to cherry pick Job and hold him up to the world and say, there's none like him in all the earth. That's pretty special. You'd think that that guy would never have a problem in the world, right? <laughs> I mean, how many of you love God in here? Wave your hand if you love God. If, if somebody doesn't have their hand up, just grab it and just hold it up there. <laughs> How many of you know today that God loves you? Hold your hand up. Hey, that's a big deal. You need to know that. You need to get that because a lot of times we don't have problems loving God. We just can't believe that God could love us. But God loves us. And so here's the catch is how could a God that loves us let us go through so much junk? That's what Job's wrestling with. His wife came to him. I mean, he gets served up a plate of chop suey, folks. 
How many of you like chop suey? Hold your hand up if you like it. Hold it up high. You put something else in your plate. <laughs> something you don't like. He gets, he gets served up a plate of chop suey. I remember when I was a kid coming up in school, I'd always look at the menu, and when they had chop suey, I would not let my mom and dad know, but I'd slip up to the store and buy a bag of potato chips and a Coke and take that to school, a candy bar, and take that to school to have a nutritious lunch. Because I wasn't eating something that I couldn't hardly spell and could not distinguish what was in the plate. He gets served up all this stuff, man, all of us, in one day. Have you had a bad year? <laughs> Most of our lives don't come close to comparing with a day Job had. All in one day, he loses. It's one servant survives to come in. Everybody else is dead. Your flocks are stolen. I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> Next one comes in, he loses camels, everything, he's losing everything. And then if that wasn't enough, somebody comes in and saying, Joe, I hate to tell you this in light of everything you've already been through, but all your kids died in a tornado. The grief is so thick at Job's house that his own wife looked at him Amen. and said, why don't you just curse God and die? And that man didn't understand why this was happening to him. He didn't understand why God would allow. He had no clue there'd been a conversation between God and Satan. He didn't know that God had held him up to Satan and said, there's none like this man. And Satan looked at God and said, you let me touch his stuff and he'll curse you. He didn't know that. And God had so much confidence in Job. He said, you can touch his stuff, but not him. And then he comes back and he says, well, what do you think about that now, Satan? What do you think about Job now? I let you touch his stuff and, and he still won't curse me. And he said, skin for skin. A man will give all he has for his own skin. And he said, you can touch him, but you can't take his life. And he breaks out and boils. His wife has told him, why don't you curse God and die? And all of his friends are some of the worst encouragers you've ever seen in your life. And Job looks at the plate that's been set before him. And he doesn't understand He's had a few alone moments with God. I wish you'd show up like a judge so I could appeal my case because I don't get it. But the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. No matter what happens, even if I die, I'm going to trust you. Amen. I refuse to walk away from your table, God. And it changed everything. So let me ask you a question. What would your decision be today? You all should have a napkin that you've received. I want you to take a moment. Don't do this hastily, but take a moment and think about it. Are you willing to say, Lord, I've been pleased to sit at the table with you. I want you to come back for me. If that's your desire, then would you take a moment and fold that napkin right now? Amen. Just take a moment and fold your napkin. Once you get it folded, if you really mean what you're saying by your action today, 
And I want you to take a moment and just say this prayer with me. Would you hold your napkin up just for a moment? And would you say this prayer with me, Lord Jesus? I love you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. Come into my heart. I hear you knocking. I open the door of my heart now. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Hey, if you really meant that, would you give him a hand clap of praise right now? But now, hold that napkin up. Hold it up. Keep, keep it up a minute. Hold it. Hold it. I'm, I'm coming to examine napkins. Hang it. Hold it up. Just keep it up there. You've got it up there. Can I borrow yours just a second? Okay, you can, you can take it back down. Said, well, what's your point? Well, <clears throat> I've got one napkin that's folded this way, and it's been through some things. <laughs> I've got another napkin folded like this. I've got another one folded like this. <laughs> and I've even got napkins of different colors. What's your point? My point is no one's circumstance is the same. We are all individuals before God. Amen. And we all have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. And even though that we may have cap or cap, we may have napkins of different color, we all sit at the same table. Amen. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. I said we all sit at the same table. So it doesn't matter whether you're red or yellow or black or white. The Bible said that we're all precious in his sight. Can I tell you, when we get to heaven, heaven is not going to be divided into sections. All the Baptists go over there. All the Lutheran go over there. And all the Pentecost and Charismatics get to the back because you're way too loud. <laughs> it's not going to happen like that. I knew one, I, I, I had a, or I knew of a, a Black pastor and a lady went up to him and said, when we get to heaven, I'm going to go on your all side for the singing because I like the way you all sing. He looked at her and said, sister, there ain't going to be but two sides, an inside and an outside, and you better make up your mind which side you want to be on. Why is it? That all of a sudden we start saying, well, God, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've experienced. You just don't have any idea. Can I tell you that the God that made you knows everything there is to know about you? Uh, and you've never had a trial that's caught him unaware. You've never had a problem that made him wring his hands uh, and pace heaven's floor and say, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, but for those that believe, uh, for those that hang on, uh, for those that in the midst of adversity fold the napkin uh, and they say I may not understand it uh, but I've got my mind made up uh, I'm going to trust in God uh, those are the ones uh, that are going to find that God has spread a table for them we, we give up how many of you have ever seen one of these they're in the coffee shop <laughs> you know what that means I used to wait tables do you know what that meant to a waiter It meant, it, it was more than just, I don't want any coffee. It was, don't bother me. Because I lived to pour coffee. <laughs> hey, you may, you can laugh, but I could pour coffee like nobody you ever saw before. I used to, this, this I'm telling you the truth. I used to, because when you're, all you do is pour coffee all night. That could get boring unless you make it exciting. And so I used to take a coffee pot. I'd, I'd take the cup of coffee. And I, I, when, when I saw a cup turned over, I got excited. <laughs> I could go across the room in a fraction of a second when I saw a cup turned up. 
And I'd take that cup away from me. I'd hold it away from the table and so that they all could see. And then I'd take the coffee pot and I'd start like this. And then I'd bring the coffee pot up. Now, this is the truth. I'm not making this up. I'd bring the coffee. If you don't believe it, you get with me after service one day and I'll see if I can still do it. But I, I would bring the coffee pot up like this and I'd have a stream of coffee going into that cup. And I had a lady look at me one day and she said, I may get burned when I go home, but I'm going to try that. <laughs> I just wanted to tell her, don't try it, lady. Don't try it. It takes the master Oh, stay with me here. You see, we're too busy trying to fill our own cups. And you're not going to get in your cup what you need in your cup. And even if you had what you need in your cup, you'd end up spilling half of it before it got there. You need to leave it to the master. To the one that knows you better than you know yourself. Amen. The one that loves you better than you love yourself. And the one that wants you more than you want yourself. Amen. The napkin is folded. Say, think about this. I may not like what I'm being served right now, but I'm turning my cup over. I'm letting God know he's welcome at my table. And I'm happy to be at his. And so I live my life in a way to receive and I may not like what's being served to me right now, but it's not going to be on my table forever. Sooner or later, there's going to be some kitchen help come by, and they're going to say, can I take that? And I'm going to say, please, <laughs> please just take it. And when they take it, there's something I know about dinner that you may have forgotten. What's the last course that's served? What? Oh, shout it. Dessert. So I may not like what I'm eating right now, but I know if I hold on, I know if I just endure. He said, be not weary and well-doing for in due season, you're going to reap if you don't faint. Just keep on keeping on. And after a while, they're going to open the door and you're going to get the aroma from the kitchen. There's some dessert going on in there. And when they come out with that last course, oh, let me tell it to you this way. Friend, the best is still yet to come. Would you stand with me today? Come on, stand with me. I don't know where you're at in your walk. I'm going to ask the prayer partners to come up right now, please. Come on, Lisa, Lance, Lloyd, don't make me. If I ask you to be a prayer partner, you know, come on up here. Come on up here. I'm not telling you life is easy. And anybody that does tell you that is lying to you. Anybody that ever told you that if, all, if you'll just give your life to God, you won't have any troubles. Has either been hit severely in the head or just hasn't, hasn't lived long enough to know any better. Life is filled with challenges. Let's not judge each other according to our challenges. Because you may be going through something and I, and I can hear about what you're going through and say, man, that, that, and, and you're struggling with that? Everybody's journey is different. Somebody may hear what I'm going through and, and say, well, you're having a problem with that? See, you may be able to very easily overcome what's trying to take me out. That's why I'm so glad that we serve a God that knows us. And he's promised I'm not going to put any more on you than you're able to bear. So here's my invitation for you. Now, you've already folded your napkin. Just a little while ago, you, you, you folded that napkin and you held it up and you said, God, I, I accept you. If you prayed that prayer with me, I don't believe those are just empty words. We make getting saved really complicated and it's simple. He paid the price so you wouldn't have to. He died in your place. So when you ask for forgiveness and, 
invite him into your heart and accept him as Lord and Savior. He doesn't say, well, let me see how you're going to do first. He immediately comes in. Now you've got the journey to navigate. Now you've got to make sure that through this journey, when you get something on your plate that you don't understand, you can't figure out that you just don't wad the napkin up and walk away. You've got to learn how to trust him. Learn that he loves you. I shared with you several years ago when I was a little boy, we'd come down to this part of the country. My grandparents lived here. My dad took me out to a place called Crab Orchard Lake, not far from here. He set me up on a rock and he backed up into the water and he said, jump to me. My little heart was pounding. I looked at him, I said, dad, I, I can't jump that far. And he said, jump to me. I'm going to teach you how to swim. I said, but dad, I can't jump that far. And he looked at me and he said, do you trust me? When he said that, I didn't even answer him. I just jumped. I couldn't understand why he was making me jump so far. I couldn't understand why he would back up what seemed like such a distance from me. But I trusted him. And when I jumped, I went under that water and man, I was scared to death for a fraction of a second. I thought, oh, I was fighting and I felt his big hands lift me up and bring me to the top of that water. And he looked at me and he smiled. He said, kick your feet, boy. Today you're going to learn how to swim. Can I tell you that God has never intended for your situation to take you under? He's going to lift you back up where you belong. He wants you to survive. He wants you to thrive. So why don't you right now, if you're going through something that you may not understand, you've got a situation going in on and you're saying, look, I, I don't want to walk away from the table. But I really need God. I need to just feel the touch of his hand for a moment. I, I need to just know that he's with me. If you follow Job's story, you know Job had got to the very end and he seemed so despondent and in so much despair and then all of a sudden God showed up in a whirlwind it amazed me how Job's thought process changed that quick because it always changes when we hear from heaven heaven wants to touch you today God wants to breathe into your situation he wants to remind you that his napkins folded and he saw you fold yours he's not going to leave you without help so if you're here and you've got a need i want you to come right now i'm not going to hold long i'm going to count to three by the time i get to three i want you to come up here just find one of the prayer partners come and stand by them right now one to just come and stand with us. Come and stand with us. We're going to, we're going to pray for you. Listen, God's, God, God is concerned about every aspect of your life. Our brother Bill's been through surgery. They're waiting for a, a report. How many of you know that God's a healer? Wave your hand if you know, understand that. Look, I, I, I've watched, I, I, I've watched God I've seen reports come back and God change your report. I've seen doctors look at x-rays and take another x-ray and look at it again and, and be confused because they didn't even think they were looking at the same x-ray. God can take care of us. He's able to heal us. Stretch your hands to heaven with me right now. As they begin to pray for you, I want you to just raise your hands to receive. Would you do it right now? Debbie's going to come out and she'll, she'll release you. Uh, but just hang with me for a minute. If you're not in a hurry, I'm not in a hurry. And I want God to work for us today. Would you stretch your hands this way? Come on, praise Him.
stretch your hands to heaven right now hold that napkin up one more time and say this is my promise God I'm not walking ever away from your table <laughs> I trust you I may not understand but I trust you and I receive it right now everything you have for me Let's give my hand clap of praise right now. Thank you, Father. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face smile on you. Those of you that are here for prayer, don't go any place. May you walk in his favor and may you find that in your darkest night, he's still your guiding light. Amen. God bless you today.